Welcome back to the second day of the sixth annual uh, conference on Belarusian studies, organized jointly by the School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies, University College London, the Rostrogorsky Center, and the Belarusian Skarina Library and Museum in London. My name is uh, Yari Krivoy, and uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you back to the second day of the conference, which will be less uh, politicized, it will be more about history, about society, about culture, but I'm sure that it will be not less uh, interesting. We have uh, three panels today. Uh, each panel will last uh, about one hour and will uh, each presentation will be about 10 minutes and uh, the rest will be devoted to a uh, Q&A session. Uh, the, uh, conference is recorded and we're going to publish uh, the recordings uh, later. I would encourage you to keep your video on uh, as much as possible uh, to make it more like a real uh, experience. And uh, with that, uh, let me introduce uh, the chair of the uh, first panel. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Alena Markova from uh, Czech Republic. Uh, uh, Alena's uh, interests are primarily in the area of uh, a nation and national nationalism, nation building, national identity formation, national uh, movement. She obtained her PhD from Charles University in uh, uh, Prague, and uh, her thesis was about the Belarusization uh, and the process of formation of the Belarusian uh, nation. She uh, recently published um, a number of uh, uh, quite interesting uh, publications in, uh, in the Belarusian language, in the uh, Czech language, and in the English language. And uh, Alena uh, is also one of the editors of the uh, Journal of, uh, of Belarusian Studies. So she, she's handling some of the submissions which we are uh, getting uh, to the journal. And she was also instrumental in uh, uh, moving to uh, the publisher, to a new publisher, because in the past it was uh, not done uh, by a professional publisher, although it was still uh, indexed by Scopus. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, invite Alena uh, to moderate her panel on history. Thank you very much again, Yarik, for such a great introduction. And I must say that this is a real great honor to be the chair of the history panel and to open the second day of the Russian Studies Conference. And um, let's talk about our speakers. Um, and our first speaker is Dr. Alexandra Pometsko. Dr. Pometsko is a researcher at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. And she teaches at the University of Manitoba in Canada. Uh, Dr. Pometska deals with history of Eastern and Central Europe, history of the Holocaust. She is an expert on migration and memory studies also. And Dr. Pometska has published an article also in the Journal of Belarusian Studies, Banditry in the Northeastern Regions of the Second Polish Republic in the 20s. So I, this is very interesting um, article. I do really recommend to read it. And today, Dr. Pometska is going to present paper narratives and memories of the 1920s Slutsk insurrection. And uh, actually, I just want to remind you some technical information. Uh, the last part of our panel will be devoted to question and answer, so you can use your voice or you can write your question in the chat box. Um, I hope uh, that our speakers and their papers will inspire a fruitful and long discussion. So, uh, Dr. Pometska, you are very welcome. The floor is yours. Hi, good morning, everyone um, from Washington, D.C., for me at least. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, I want to thank the Ostrogorsky Center, uh, University College London, and the Francis Kalina Library for putting this um, conference together and for doing so since I first participated in, in 2016. So thank you very much for, for doing this and for allowing us to, to meet um, in this way. Uh, my research focuses on what I'm really interested in 
uh, is the period of the immediate aftermath of the First World War and into the 1920s. And I'm really interested in um, this continued conflict, irregular war in Eastern Europe and also the former Soviet space. Uh, and one of the things that I'm, I've been working on quite a bit and trying to conceptualize and think about are the events that took place in Slutsk in November and December of 1920. Uh, a series of armed confrontations occur between the Red Army uh, and Belarusian forces, Slutsk brigades, and though the fighting was limited to this district and this area, it was really caused by diplomatic debates occurring in Riga in October of 1920 between uh, the Bolsheviks and the Poles. And as a result of these uh, early negotiations, the Slutsk district was left in Soviet territory. Uh, and as a result of this border demarcation, various Belarusian activists from the region, but also from different parts of, of the Kresy or borderland region, traveled to Slutsk to organize um, politically, uh, culturally, but also militarily. They organized two Slutsk brigades fighting. Uh, they sought out help from the Polish Fourth Army secretly, but they received weapons, money, training, things like that. Eventually, though, after about a month and a half of fighting uh, between the Red Army and the Slutsk Brigades, this insurrection was, was quashed by the Red Army. Uh, so this event in history, uh, of course, in the West, it's something that people don't really know much about. Among Belarusian scholars, it's something that's a little bit better known, but not really discussed um, much in, in scholarship. But I find the events of 1920 in Slutsk to be compelling for a few reasons. First, I think it's very interesting because I think Slutsk and the and we look at it if we look at it as a case study, it really uh, presents many many interesting intersections between sort of the chaos of the aftermath of the First World War and civil wars. Whether you think of the Russian civil wars or you think of the broader concept of civil war in Europe happening at this time. Uh, you see this revolutionary process that also uh, affected many of the actors that participated in the, in the insurrection. And so there's many entanglements ideologically between fighters, between moving, moving soldiers that had formerly fought for different armies. Uh, of course, the intersection with local socioeconomic issues also resulting from war. So all of these things culminated, I believe, and that's how I understand the insurrection. And of course, the continuance of violence, right? Just because diplomatic treaties are signed doesn't mean that war and conflict is not over. The other reason I find the narrative of Slutsk very compelling, and this is what I want to focus on more in my presentation, is the ways in which this narrative has been discussed and talked about in the last 100 years, with last November 2020 being the centennial anniversary of these events. And I examine sort of the way in which it's been remembered both in Belarus, but also uh, among Belarusian emigres abroad. Not surprisingly, in the 1920s and 1930s, Soviet historiography made very little mention of the events. It was seen as something that was entirely orchestrated by the Poles or by foreign agents. And so very little agency was given to these Slutsk or Belarusian actors or locals who had participated uh, in the insurrection. And the event was, of course, referred to as counter-revolutionary, anti-Soviet, uh, as part of this nationalist bourgeois movement uh, and infiltration into this Bolshevik project. And of course, uh, among Belarusian activists, in uh, the 20th century, in the mid 20th century, living outside of Soviet Belarus, whether it be in other parts of Europe or North America or, or Latin America, uh, they saw this insurrection and the failure of this insurrection as really um, reflective of the way in which they had failed in this nationalist project that was contrary to this, the Soviet project especially in comparison to neighboring nations like Lithuania and Poland. So whereas Poles and Lithuanians were able to have their own state following the First World War, uh, Belarusians were denied this opportunity. And this is the way this 
uh, discourse about the insurrection came up uh, among Belarusian activists. During the Second World War, the story of the Slutsk fighters and the insurrection is brought up again. And it's referred to many times as the Slutsk myth. Former participants of the insurrection of the insurrection in 1920, who were still alive in the 1940s, uh, who actively collaborated with the Germans, gave speeches to many new recruits and stressed that these new Belarusian recruits who were collaborating with the Germans were a sort of reincarnation of the Slutsk fighters that the Belarusian Auxiliary Police, uh, uh, Self-Defense, uh, Home Guard, were a reincarnation of the Slutsk Brigades. And this rhetoric was discussed quite frequently um, in motivational speeches, in educational settings with Belarusian soldiers. And so it kind of developed um, in a very different way uh, into the Second World War. After the war, you have another wave of, of course, emigres in North America, South America, Australia, who continued remembering the events in Slutsk. And these are um, uh, some just newspaper clippings that I have put up. And they, of course, began or continued to commemorate the events, usually in November and December of that year. And they continue to talk about this abandonment of Belarusians by um, other states. They talked a lot about the need. Um, for them to fight occupying regimes of both Moscow and Warsaw, despite the fact that the insurgents in 1920 actually had received help from Poland. Uh, one Belarusian uh, activist, uh, Alexei Kabitschkin, in 1953 noted, and I'm quoting, the Slutsk uprising physically ended with the enemy's victory over our fatherland, Batskoshchina, Nevertheless, the movement of the Slutsk insurgents has great meaning in the history of the Belarusian national movement because this uprising was the first of its kind, organized at the national level, an armed struggle for the liberation of all of Belarus." End quote. Uh, so, of course, there continue to be commemorations um, since the end of the Second World War, both in Slutsk uh, and, of course, in many places outside of Slutsk. In one of the places I did my grad studies, Toronto was a big um, center also where they commemorated this insurrection. But until 1920, or I'm, I'm sorry, until 2020, much of the commemoration has focused on the fighters themselves, on this part of history being part of a larger Belarusian national liberation um, movement. Uh, the 27th of November, the Day of Heroes, of course, always commemorates the Slutsk insurrection. Films are screened, public lectures are given uh, by historians, by activists, uh, and people gather to commemorate the event. Uh, the current regime in Belarus does not officially ban these gatherings and commemorations, but they're heavily monitored. They're heavily, they're heavily um, monitored, and in many cases disbanded. Um, various film screenings, such as the one in 2013 that was officially planned um, for the screening of the 40 Day Peasants Republic, uh, abruptly ended when the police arrived in the screening, at the screening and people began to be interrogated. So um, that's kind of the reality of, of, of that in Belarus. I would be remiss not to talk a little bit about how the events in August of last year affected the commemorations in November of 2020. And there is a significant change in discourse and rhetoric when it comes to the commemoration. Uh, articles that came out in the fall of last year focused much less on this anti-Bolshevik element of the struggle or this armed element of the struggle and focused much more into on uh, the youths and education and culture and pedagogy. Uh, and a correlation is being made not between fighters then and now, but young individuals who fought for their beliefs, much like the youths involved in the protests um, in Belarus. Uh, one very renowned Belarusian historian, as many of you guys um, I'm sure know, Nina Stuzhinskaya, made a trip to Slutsk, uh, I believe a month before in October 2020, to discuss the significance of the insurrection today. And her focus was not on the fighters or insurgents, but rather on youth groups active in Slutsk during the time of the insurrection. And here she remarked, and I'm quoting, those Slutsk students nearly 100 years later 
continue to give us a lesson on Belarusian national consciousness today. Nowadays, we can hear that we need to fight for democracy, the return of the 1994 constitution and the Belarusian language, end quote. So the interpretation of Slutsk is very interesting at this moment uh, in many ways because of what happened in August of last year. And the shift has obviously gone from this armed aspect um, of the insurrection and shifted to more um, of a discussion of struggle for cultural preservation and sustainability. And the value of the Slutsk insurrection much, you know, maybe contrary to what originally attracted me to the topic historically may not the value may not be historical so much as um, maybe a reflection more of contemporary attitudes in belarus and and abroad in terms of culture and society and where we are so i'm going to stop there because i think my time is up but um thank you and i look forward to your to your comments uh thank you very much alexandra it was perfect timing and uh, so um our Next speaker is Professor Boris Cherny from the University of Caen, France. So I hope my French pronunciation is correct. Uh, he's the head of the Faculty of Modern Foreign Languages at the University of Caen in France. And Professor Cherny is a prominent and well known expert in the field of Russian Jewish and Ukrainian Jewish studies. Uh, especially culture, uh, cult knowledge transfer, literature, and civilization. And Professor Cherney is an author of many, many great publications in this field. Uh, the publications are in many, many languages, so you choose your favorite one uh, to read this publication. And today, Professor Cherney is going to talk about the Jewish population of Brest Litovsk during the period of German occupation 1915-1918. So please, uh, Professor Chorney, you're very welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, slideshow. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your invitation. I have a lot of publications because I am not very young. <laughs> um, I'm going to speak about Brest-Litovsk uh, during the First World, uh, first, uh, World War and uh, about the Jewish pop uh, population of the town. Our knowledge of the situation on the Eastern Front during the First World War is getting more and more precise and detailed. But the history of certain towns and their populations during the war has not yet been written. This is the case of Brest-Litovsk in particular. The name of this city situated at the confluence of the Bug and Buchavitz rivers is generally only mentioned in the treaty signed in 1918 between the Central Empire and Ukraine and between the governments of the Central Empires and the young Russian Bolshevik Republic. But until now, no study has been devoted to the history of the city and its population between August 1915, I mean, the departure of the Russian forces and the beginning of the German occupation and February 1919, the end of the German occupation and the German-Ukrainian administration of part of the occupied territories. Why do we know less about the Jewish population of Brest-Litovsk during the First World War than of other towns in this area, for example, Bialystok, uh, Grodno, um, or Pilno? Many studies have been already devoted to the Northern Territory um, managed separately by the German army covering Lithuania, as well as part of present-day Eastern Poland and Belarus, the Oberost. Uh, and we know about, almost, almost nothing, sorry, about two territories who had their own management structure. The Etappen Inspection Vorst on the north and the Etappen Inspection Book. This is a map of the Inspection Book with Brest task in the center. 
the limited number of studies on Brasitovsk, more precisely about the Jewish population of the town during the First World War, provides a researcher with a new field of investigation. For my investigation, I use different kinds of documents, diaries of German officer, a report in Yiddish from a Jewish writer, Avram Kaplan, who lived in Brasitovsk, and different reports of the German army, German passports, and other documents delivered by the German authorities. It generally accepted that all civilians had left the city voluntarily or by force when the Russian army left in August 1915, and that Brest remained a military base until 1918 and the return of the first inhabitants and the registration by the Polish authorities in the year 1918-1920. I believe, and this is my thesis, that it's possible to show some of the history of the Jewish population of Brest during that time, there is a time span 1915-1920. It can be considered from and it can be considered on its own field, field of investigation, but I believe that it can also be included into a longer period from 1915 to 1942 by looking at the facts from the expulsion of the, um, uh, or departure of the inhabitants of the city in 1915 to the extermination of the entire Jewish population by the Nazi in October 1942. It generally accepted that the Jews who made up nearly 70% of Brest inhabitants were expelled from their homes and from on the road in August 1950. In fact, Passes authorizing, uh, passes or authorizing exit from the Pale of Seltamen were granted to Jewish inhabitants at the beginning of July 1915. According to a survey by the Joint, joint um, Jewish Philanthropic Organization, in August 1915, of the 40,000 Jews living in Brest, 2,000 had found refugee in the neighboring town and villages near Brest, and 20,000 had gone further in Russia. I don't know, we don't know where the third part of the non-Jewish inhabitants went. Figures from the census conducted in Grodno by the, author, by the authorities, uh, by the Ober Oath authorities in 1916, offer some food for, for thought. In 1897, the Jews um, represented 47% of the population of Grodno. The Jews represented, represented 63% of, Jew, of the population of Grodno. It seems that proportionally, the non-Jewish population left their place of residence more than the Jewish population. The number of the Jewish inhabitants is confirmed by Jewish by German officers, sorry, who state in their diaries that when you walk, I quote, when you walk through these areas, you only see Jews. And among the members of the different ethnic groups they meet, Jews seems to be more present than others. It's also the conclusion we can make when we read different reports of the German authorities about the inspection at Appenburg. Fight highlighted in these reports are the possibility given to Jews to acquire land, the right to participate in civil arbitration courts, the installation of Jews of the Jews of Brest in different towns and villages not far from Brestetovsk, the use of uh, the Jewish labor force in woodcutting and agriculture. I would like to underline the philanthropic action of the German authorities which organized schools and canteens for the Jewish population of Brest-Litovsk, which live in different little towns in Belarus or in actual Poland. This philanthropic organization was supervised by a German rabbi, Aaron Tanze. Tanze also contributed to, make, to, making, know the, to making the history of the Jewish community in Brest known in German through two books, 
uh, erode during uh, his stay in the city. Uh, an examination of the various documents we have on the Jewish inhabitants of Brest allows us to conclude that they were very that they were forced and coerced by the Russian authorities and then by the German army to leave the city. Many of them found refugee, refugee of the surrounding villages and towns where community structures continued to operate in interaction with the German authority who granted them the same rights as other ethnic groups, included access to local manager schools, courts, and public canteens. Passports, as we can see, also reflect the constraints exercised by the German administration. The current number uh, in the photographs of the passports suggest that the population census, which, which, which was in force in the um, uh, Oberost was also in force in Brasitovsk. This count number um, uh, was a part of a large settlement project in the east of the German population, and at the same time, displacement of the indigenous population, and in particular of the Jews. This settlement plan was supported by statistical survey and census of ethnic groups. Nothing allows us to claim that this was the intention of the German authority for the Etappe in Action book, even if the facts suggest that it was the case. Brest had been untied of its inhabitant, inhabitants, and in the Etappe in Action book, Jewish people were counted just as in the rest of the occupied territories, and certainly, and certainly also for the same reasons. Um, it will be uh, wrong to give, and it will be my conclusion, it will be wrong to give a theological reading of the situation of the Jewish population of Brest in 1915 by taking into account the Shoah, the Holocaust. At the same time, it's difficult to emancipate, emancipate oneself from this absolute benchmark, benchmark and the very content of the documents, we can see different documents here, um, of the documents incite us to look beyond the line of the end of the hostilities of the First World War and to consider the 1915-1942 span in its entirety. Thus, um, in fact, you can see different mix and superposition of languages on these passports, which was uh, used later by the inhabitants of Brest in order to prove that they had been resi residing well before the war in territory that they had become Polish and to obtain a temporary or definitive right of residence. The Jews who had been forced to leave, um, um, sorry, um, uh, to leave their place of residence, which had often been destroyed, as in Brasitovsk, faced hostility from an administration that didn't recognize the right to, to live in Poland or only with great difficulty. The analysis of these documents, for example, a document delivered in 1915 and then in, uh, in 1915 and then in 20, uh, 1920, the analysis of these documents uh, uh, that we intend to, to that I intend to carry out in the future, so enable me to take an epigraphic examination of the variety of the estimations provided and to trust the biographies of the Jewish inhabitants of Brasitovsk. All these biographies will, I hope, provide a social cartography of the anti-Jewish population of Brasitovsk in 1920s. Then in 1941, with the examination of all the protocols of registration, registration of the Jews by the Nazi in 1941, when the ghetto was set up. Thank you. So thank you very much, Professor Czerny, for such an interesting presentation. And now it's time to move uh, to our third presenter. And our fourth, um, I guess, headliner of today's um, section um, will be uh, Marina Laurinovich. 
Uh, Marina Laurinovic is a PhD student at the Charles University in Prague in the Czech Republic here. And Marina deals with Soviet history of Belarus of post-war period. Uh, Marina studies memory issues, commemoration, transformation of memory, Soviet and national identity, and uh, so on. And today she is going to present her paper evolution of the image of Fyodor Masherov in historical memory in post-socialist Belarus after 19th. So, Marina, you are very welcome. The floor is yours. Uh, the topic of my report uh, is uh, evaluation of the image of Fyodor Masherov in historical memory uh, post-socialist Belarus after 1990s. Uh, Petr Masherov uh, was one of the most and uh, outstanding Communist Party leader of the Belarusian Soviet Republic, uh, who uh, leaders leadership due, during the era of the late socialism uh, has been made as an independent period due to the 15 years. Uh, he has spent as actual head of the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic as well as uh, due to the charisma uh, of Masharov's personality. Is the circumstances expanding crisis of the Soviet model a Soviet model succeeding leader of the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic had not been able to surpass of the figure uh, Masherov, uh, who represented the type of politician of close to the people. The Soviet uh, periods. And under Mashur rules and the, 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 the image of the Perhaps you could turn off your camera because the, I think the connection, the internet connection is not great. So if you turn off your camera and just leave the presentation uh, on. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, pardon. Under Peter Masher's rule of the BSSR, uh, on I, the I'm image, so sorry, Marina. Yeah. Of the Partisan Republic, uh, never sells references of the Belarusian, uh, Belarusian uh, part of the history gate by the Soviet people in general didn't not conflict with the widely spread Soviet identity. The Belarusian party leaders lobbied Minsk uh, recognition uh, as hero city and realized various grandiose symbolizes. Uh, Peter Masherov himself earned an additional prestige among uh, the population as an organized and leader of the local partisan, partisan uh, movement. Oh, thank you. Uh, even after Masherov's tragic death, uh, there were a burning discussion of the subject of his personality and activities that uh, been uh, debated by both professional historical and the general public. The example of active discussion uh, concerning the historical role of Peter Masherov in Belarusian history Three, uh, shows the historical complication which occurs of the representation of statements of, of the Communist Party of Belarus no history. According to the first evaluation uh, that 
uh, is held by various professional, uh, professional historical. Uh, Peter Masherov was a sex, sex, successful chairman of the party, as well as an extremely committed uh, who establishment in, in the policy of BSSR with some degree of independence uh, consulting man in however with Moscow. According, according to the uh, according to the as uh, opinion, Peter Masherov was an intelligent, intelligent and democratic leader, leader uh, who fought uh, for the interest uh, of the BSSR and commanded the respect respect of the Russian population. Uh, as the actual head of the Republic, he created a high industrial potential and made of the SSR and the most highly developed republics of the Union. In the, uh, in the mass consciousness, uh, consciousness of the Belarusian population, uh, Masher's leadership, which uh, coincided with the air of stagnation, either uh, Leonid Brezhnev had been defined as the golden age of the period of prosperity, uh, who wish be uh, who wish the exhibit exhibit exhibited our Belarus, our fifty years old, who had. In his Petr Masharov and the head of the Belarusian Communist Party appeal out of nostalgic emphasis. According, uh, according of the sociologist Alexei Lastovsky, this evaluation is granted in the fact uh, that after 1994 and before uh, 2010, uh, Peter Masharov had been one of the most promoted personality of the Belarusian state ideology, uh, since had been used as tool to the appeal uh, to the positive experience of Soviet past of the in independence of his policy. Uh, having said the emphasis on the uh, positive position of Peter Masherov has not a united factor for the Belarusian national identity. Uh, it, it must be emphasized that being the most significant personality of, of post-war history, a social Belarus whose spirit the present is a collective memory currently living a generation. Masharov could uh, not avoid a symbolic conflict with Alexander Lukashenko, the modern leader of Belarus who began the presidential career uh, by appealing by, to the Soviet system achievements. Uh, in the course after thirty years long period, uh, Peter Masher Fage uh, has fortified uh, its extremely stable position in the state. In the state, uh, initiated memory policy that is being conducted in modern Belarus. Uh, the mention period could be divided under two uh, stages. The first stage of the characterized by the acknowledgement of Peter Masher's achievement with respect to the establishment of Soviet Belarus. The period after uh, 2005 uh, coincided with the con uh, conscious tree to adult life of the generation uh, who has born in independent rules and who has been an Unaware of the Soviet part, Peter uh, Masher of image into the chain of our achievements of post war socialism in the BSR, which in the sense a uh, peculiar in indicator of the attitude toward of the Soviet past in the consciousness of post modern Belarusians and the government, which has been. 
actually uh, now I'm checking the text of the speech, the text of the paper, so printed paper I have on my screen, and this is very end of this of the paper and uh, of the speech, and um, so I guess uh, this is the very last uh, slide at, of the PowerPoint presentation and. I guess we just can't uh, we, we just can't start discussion. So, and um, your questions are very welcome. Your remark comments probably because we have ten minutes more, or let's say uh, twelve minutes more. And so, um, I will be glad, and our speakers will be glad if you have some questions. So, thank you. Um, my question is uh, to Alex. Uh, uh, thank you for this uh, presentation about uh, memory of um, about uh, Slutsk insurrection. And uh, in the recent years, before events of 2020, there were a rise of uh, interest to Slutsk uprising. Uh, there were some uh, video, uh, uh, music videos uh, recorded and some songs performed. So I was uh, pretty surprised that uh, in the during this uh, revolutionary autumn of 2020, so many attention were attracted to the Slutsk uprising, despite uh, general attention of Belarusians uh, became really uh, interested in uh, historical events, in uh, different historical uh, figures like uh, Kastus Klinowski and so on. But uh, uh, this uh, Slutsk uprising and this, uh, this Day of Heroes had even less attention this year in, in uh, public space than in recent years. So Alex, can you somehow explain why, despite uh, the revolutionary context, uh, this uprising, this day of heroes was to, uh, not so prominent and much less prominent that it is potentially could be, uh, or maybe I am mistaken and the uh, things go different this time. Thank you. Uh, should I answer this now or are we going yeah, I, to... I guess uh, this is time because I guess uh, Marina has like, like technical troubles and probably it, it's better to answer right now. Okay. Take the time. Sure. And I'll keep my answers short. Uh, thank you for your question, Vital. Uh, so you're right there. I think it depends on perspective. I think it depends if you're looking at whether it's being commemorated in Belarus itself or outside. There was actually a big online event. I think that was like almost three, four hours long that was commemorating this day of the heroes. And I think there's a recording of it somewhere. And I listen, I didn't listen to all of it, but there was a lot of music being played, speeches being made, um, of course, linked to what was happening you know, after August, but there was a huge celebration, um, but many people you know, participated in some way throughout this three hour period. So, you know, virtually, but still something. Uh, and I think, I mean, I can't speak so much as to what, you know, in Belarus, why things maybe were not commemorated as much as they were before. And you're right, there's so many like YouTube videos you could watch about um, aspects of the Slutsk insurrection. And um, the only thing I can say is that, you know, people were occupied with other things um, and preoccupied with more important <laughs> events maybe than commemorating. Uh, the Slutsk, the Slutsk insurrection, but there was there was a big, you know, three four hour um, virtual event to commemorate this. So I'll just say that. Well, I will uh, unmute myself. And uh, also, we have uh, another question from Dr. Hadeletovana Joanna Getka from University of Warsaw. I will just uh, will articulate this question in the chat box. What Belarusians should do with the memory of the Slutsk uprising and about Masharov memory in the current situation? It means uh, the need of keeping Belarusian Russian contact. So, and uh, because uh, the connection of Marina is not stable, probably um, I will um, give this question to Alex. So, if, if you don't mind, like both of them, like Masharov memory and uh schools memory because you deal with memory so i guess this is this is an interesting question i uh, i don't want to speak for for marina and i'm not an expert on Masharal, but oh, yeah. uh, i think um just talking maybe more broadly about 
about memory. Uh, I don't think something should be done necessarily um, because, or, I mean, that's my opinion. I don't think it's maybe useful to think about what should be done. Uh, I think that these events, whether we look at Mashara or the Slutsk um, uh, insurrection, uh, are in interesting historically in their context, but they're also a really interesting reflection of where we are now and how we situate ourselves with historical events. And so as Marina noted in one of her slides, after the 1990s, this post-Soviet generation um, looks at Mashado very differently than people who are um, of a different generation. And so I think it's more of a relationship of where we see ourselves in relation to historical events. Uh, but I, and we can't talk about objectivity because in history, you know, there's, there's you can't be objective. So I think it's more about a reflection of maybe thinking about where we are contemporarily and how we how we see these historical events. But I don't think there should we should see something in a certain way. There are many ways to see events. Uh, so yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. And um, the next question. Um, Yarek's question, so... Uh... Thank you. Yeah. I have uh, two questions, uh, one for Alex and one for Boris. Um, my question for Alex um, is about uh, the uh, political attitudes of those people who were uh, participating in this, uh, who were participating in the Slutsk uprising. Were they leftists? Were they rightists? What, did they have any clear uh, ideology? Uh, or was it just against uh, the, the, the Tsar or the, you know, the, the Russian Empire or the Soviets? Uh, because as I understand, many of them were former soldiers, right? So they, this one of the reasons why it was easier for them to organize. And uh, my question to, to Boris is um, similar. I know that in the Dumas, uh, in, in the Russian Empire, there were several uh, Jewish fractions uh, so Bund, I think, it was one of those, uh, and and uh, there probably there were many, I imagine, uh, also Jewish political organizations acting active on the territory uh, of Belarus at the beginning of the 20th century. Have you come in, uh, across any interesting uh, evidence uh, of that? Thank you. Um. Alex, do you want to answer? No, um, I don't have. Um, I don't think the Bund was represented in the Duma. All the fractions were represented: uh, Sarinist and all the and SR, KD. But uh, what about uh, concerning the Bund? I'm not sure. But I don't have uh, any answer to to give to your question, uh, Yarik, because uh, as I know. Uh, Bresitalk is uh, the town of Begun and Ariel Shannon. It was more a Sionist town than a Bundist town. <laughs> and this is why the, the structure of the community can re could rebirth very quickly after the war, because the organization was still alive, was still alive during the war, and especially Sionist organization, not Bundist. Thank you very much. So, and the second speaker. And we have one more question from uh, Yekaterina. Yeah, I can see you. Uh, I'll just answer Yadik's question quickly. It was a variety of, of people from different um, political um, leanings. You, of course, have members from the uh, Belarusian People's Republic, the BNR who were actively participating, but you have many socialist revolutionaries. That was the biggest party in Belarus um, that attracted quote unquote Belarusians at this time. So you have members from those parties. You have um, uh, not a variety of, of, of people participating. Uh, Radoslav Ostrowski was in Slutsky, he's from Slutsky, participated in the uprising. Many soldiers, Todor, Todor uh, Daniliuk. So soldiers, activists, Youths, um, people from really a variety of 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 political um, of political inclinations and programs. Obviously, you don't have a, a ton of Bolsheviks participating in the Slutsk uprise uh, insurrection, but but definitely a variety. And I think, uh, if anything, in the later years, the Ben Ar uh, 
Belarusian People's Republic narrative really is pushed more strongly about their uh, role in the, in the insurrection, but it was really not dominated necessarily just by, by members of that party, but really a, a cohort, um, a slutskrada of different political parties. Uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, also, uh, I have one more question from Yekaterina Pearson, Dr. Pearson, and also a several question if we have time, if we are lucky enough, and if we have uh, some more minutes, um, some questions from Ursula Wuli. And so, Yekaterina, your question, please. Well, I'll, I'll try to keep it short then. Um, yesterday, we mentioned the soft nationalism in the 2010s or soft Belarusianization. And uh, this is a like a societal process that was supported uh, by the government. And so part of this process was the um, uh, construction of, um, of monuments uh, to the heroes of the Grand Duke of Lithuania, for instance. Uh, but uh, my question is, uh, has the um, official stance, uh, the official attitude uh, changed uh, during this period uh, on the uh, Kluk uh, uprising or uh, in comparison with the 2000s, for instance, uh, and has this uh, liberalization, slight liberalization, has it affected the, the um, um, memory of this memory of politics? Uh, I assume you mean from this, the state official? Um, per, okay. Uh, no, it has not changed as far as I know. I this I haven't examined, you know, tons of textbooks, but it's not something that takes up a lot of, you know, uh, space on pages. Uh, it's not something that the state, as far as I know, denies or completely does not talk about. Um, but it's not something that's necessarily highlighted so much. Uh, in terms of monuments, there's a monument in Germany to the Slutsk um, insurgents. Uh, but in terms of a shift in that perspective from 2010 to now, I don't see that, but I could be wrong. Maybe someone knows um, more about this in terms of monuments and commemoration um, than, than I do. Thank you. In London, by the way, it's one of two regular events uh, organized every year by the Association of Belarusians in Great Britain. One is the, the BNR in, uh, in March and then the Slutsk uh in in the autumn yeah exactly uh thank you very much for your remark and we have like a one or two questions from uh dr woolley but i'm not sure if we are if we are allowed to have yeah like... that's fine we started a bit later so it's okay. yeah thank you very much so i i hope that uh it will be okay so um please thank you uh thank you dr markova I'll be very brief. One question is for Marina, so maybe it should wait till afterwards anyway, but I wanted to pose it. I'm interested to hear more about uh, Lukashenko's policy of depersonalization of history, which I think she said Tatiana Ostrovskaya had written about. I'm interested to hear more about that, that, but maybe now is not the time. And the second is a question for Dr. Pomiechko, linking it to Mark Sienkiewicz's uh, recent paper, which maybe we're going to hear about afterwards, uh, the idea that the uh, collective identity which is evolving as a result of the uh, protests over the last months uh, is more based on, a, on a, a shared coming to terms with the Soviet past, and that squeezes out narratives like the Slutsk narrative. And would you say, based on your experience and perhaps based on what Professor, Professor Krivoy has said, that that's currently more of a diaspora thing, and do you see that changing? That's a very good question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think I think there's a, there's a lot of different elements about what you asked. Uh, diaspora versus domestic, Soviet coming to terms with the Soviet history versus pre. Uh, I certainly see there is a preoccupation, and I think this is not unique to Belarus um, or scholarship with a taking a, a look again at the Soviet sort of history. Um, and thinking about those things, and especially in the context of Mashero and how this plays today. Uh, I don't, 
I think there's certainly a lot of attention on Slutsk for individuals who are just interested in the past and history. So I don't see this the Soviet period competing necessarily with this, um, you know, the Slutsk um, part of uh, the events. Uh, it's just, yeah, I, I don't really know how to answer that. It's very good. I just, I don't see them sort of in competition. I don't see one being focused on more over the other. I see it that, you know, there's just more of the Soviet period to, to talk about um, and has probably has a far greater bearing on today than the Slutsk insurrection does. And so the attention is just focused more on that. But um, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for question and for answer. I totally agree uh, with uh, Alexandra. This is very, very interesting question. So, but we are running off um, our time and now we have to finish uh, history panel. So see you in um, 10 minutes, I guess. So Yarek, the floor is yours. Please say something uh, as a conclusion remark. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alena. And uh, we will see you in uh, in seven minutes. Yeah. At ten, two ten uh, UK time.